Great, thank you. Greetings, everyone. Good day, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar today. It's great to see so many uh, friends joining us, and the numbers are increasing as we as we speak from uh, from all all over the world. So, thank you for joining us for this event today. My name, for those of you that that don't know me, is Dr. Gary Smith, and I'm the president of the Faculty of Homeopathy. And I'm very pleased to see you all here today, both those of you here in the UK, I see, and in many different countries around the world. So thank you for joining us. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. The event is being recorded, um, and that recording will be made available uh, afterwards. So if you're watching it and catch up, thank you for tuning in. But it's uh, particularly special to see you, uh, those of you that have joined live. So. This is the the tenth installment, part ten of this series of this series of webinars, um, third one this year, uh, but it's the part ten overall um, on a series of working with what works in homeopathy, and as those of you that have been uh, joining us for for each installment uh, are aware, this represents a collaboration between the Faculty of Homeopathy and Vitulcus Compass, and. I'd like to say how pleased I am uh, that we're collaborating in this way and unable to provide these uh, sessions. So thank you to our friends in Botulcus Compass for their support of the Faculty of Homeopathy. As, as most of you know, if not all of you know, our, our speaker uh, at each of these events is our good friend, Dr. Uh, is our good friend, Andrew Ward who's no, well known to, to, to most of us, if not all of us. Andrew is the UK ambassador for Vitulcus Compass and um, is a busy practitioner and educator as well. So today, his case uh, will be, uh, he'll be presenting a case of multi, of comorbidity and chronic disease treated successfully with classical homeopathy. And it does sound like a very complex case. I haven't seen the case, but it sounds like a really complex and interesting case, um, a patient with chronic rhinitis, sinusitis, hypertension, indigestion, uh, and many years disease. So multiple pathology, multiple comorbidity, and, uh, and it'll be interesting to see uh, Andrew's approach to this case and the responses following homeopathic treatment. Um, and once again, Andrew will be demonstrating how uh, that correctly chosen homeopathic medicine uh, can bring about profound changes uh, to the organism. And uh, particularly, he'll be demonstrating the use of Vitilicus Compass software and how that can be useful in choosing the, the, the prescription, uh, both initially, and I'm quite sure we'll see plenty of follow-ups as well and analysis. So this should be an interesting webinar. I hope you all uh, enjoy it. Um, Please add your questions to the chat box as we go through. And at the end uh, of the webinar, um, we'll put all those questions to Andrew and see if he can answer them all um, after his presentation's over. And, and also, please do stay to the end. I've got some uh, interesting news uh, to announce at the end of the webinar about our next date and also another special event coming up that I, I'd like to share the information with you. So I hope you stay with us right to the end. Um, but for now, I think that's probably all I have to say. Uh, I'll uh, thank you once again for attending and hand over to Andrew. Okay, thank you, Gary. Thank you very much again for your, your wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, it's once again a great honor for me to be presenting uh, and being part of this uh, great series of webinars with the Faculty of Homeopathy and uh, the support of the Tulkas Compass. So today I'll be presenting this case of chronic disease, multiple conditions. And this, this case was from um, 2010. So, March 2010. So let me get started with this. 
Share my screen here. Okay. So we'll go through the case on the right hand side here. This is one of the features of Compass alongside the uh, all the different analyses and prescriptions. You can be putting in your case so that this is kept and then subsequent follow-ups can be added, all the usual uh, word processing things here. And we have some templates also, which I won't show you now, but these are set templates for questions for types of conditions and um, help those that are perhaps new to the uh, process so that they can fill in the, the uh, gaps on those templates and gives them a, a better idea of the questions to ask, etc. cetera. Um, okay. This, this lady, she 54 year old lady came to see me in 2010. And her history was that she was unmarried and had spent most of her time looking after elderly patient parents who were 89 and 90 years old respectively. So a very caring and gentle soul, I thought, um, very dedicated to her parents, described herself as very empathetic, very easily affected by emotions. So she presented with chronic rhinitis, and nasal obstruction with chronic sinusitis with subsequent headaches since she was 22 years old. So we're looking at 32 years of this chronic condition, which had been treated with all sorts of uh, nasal sprays and the usual decongestants uh, without any change in the chronic status of, of the condition. Also, six years ago, she'd taken antidepressants for two years and then developed Meniere's disease after this, which is a, is a very chronic condition affecting the balance uh, with vertigo, spinning room attacks and vomiting, very severe. Also, menopausal hot flushes had come in in the last two years. <coughs> As a child, she'd had repeated acute inflammations with fever, such as otitis media, ear infections, and abscesses. Her adenoids were removed. Her headaches went recently when she stopped eating dairy products. Somebody had advised her, stop eating dairy, the headaches went, but nothing else. History of nosebleeds as a child, frequent nosebleeds. Fears, frogs, snakes, and thunder, lightning. Her last high fever was in her 20s, i.e. 30 years ago. So for those of you who know the levels of health, this will most likely place her in group three, um, with a lack of high fever and chronic conditions developing. Bruises very easily. Also has developed gastritis and acid indigestion. Knew him. Okay. Um, so 
Judina Lulsa 13 years ago, and she was 41. Drugs currently taking meprazole um, for the for the as stomach acid, phenylol for uh, blood pressure, which also she has slightly raised blood pressure and beta histamine, which is for the vertigo and the, the menias. So this is her history. Um, Prognosis I've put here, we can, we can check this with the level of health uh, and we can assess this at probably level seven, group three, as she's had no fever in the last 30 years and has at the same time developed chronic complaints which have gone deeper into the organism. The inflammatory process has gone from simple acutes as a child to more serious ears, mucous membranes, to sinus, to stomach, and now the vascular system, the blood pressure, and more recently, menias, also known, I understand, as endolymphatic hydrops, term for menias, a serious vestibular disorder. So her original level of health was group one with, uh, with her ear, ear infections and fever. So with correct treatment, what we, will we expect to happen? We will expect a strong aggravation in level seven or eight, where we're assuming she is, according to the levels of health understanding and scheme. Uh, aggravations in group three are quite strong, so it can be very severe. Uh, in level seven, usually it's around about a week before you start to see amelioration. So the, the level self gives us uh, a nice roadmap, if you like, to understand what we can expect from the patient and also what we can inform the patient as to what might happen. It's very important in my experience because if we don't tell them, they get completely uh, disturbed when they start to aggravate uh, and many will want to run off to the hospital or back to the doctor and take some some things if we explain the process to them that there'll be this aggravation and then improvement don't worry about it reassure them and then when this actually happens they they, they understand that you know what you're doing and talking about so uh, I believe that she could regain her health and get back to her former level of health. This is the idea, bring her back to group one. Uh, assessment, here we have a clear case of a chronic inflammatory disorders that developed at a certain time in her life, 22, following the all too common history of suppression of acute disease as a child from five to eight with ear infections and abscesses with high fever. These were treated with antibiotics many times and adenoids removed. Uh, then beta histamine and steroid nasal sprays used for many years for her sinus and rhinitis. At 40 years old, she then developed a stomach ulcer which healed but left her with gastritis and acid indigestion. A maprazole was given. One year later, at 41, after this treatment, she developed hypertension. Uh, and this is treated with a maintenance dose of atenolol. Then six years ago, depression was diagnosed at 48. And antidepressants given for two years. Then at 50, many years started. So you see the progression from five years old to 50. 45 years, you see the progression of how the inflammatory process goes from one system to another deeper and deeper and deeper, finally affecting her emotional level and then her 
many years starting. So her original level of health as a child was good, probably belonging to group two. However, by her early 20s, she'd stopped getting fevers and developed her chronic disorders, suggesting she dropped into group three. Here, there are no acutes anymore and no fevers, but chronic disorders manifest. Um, still on a relatively superficial level, the mucous membranes, however, through repeated use of nasal sprays and steroids and decongestants, she suppressed the inflammation. And by 40, she developed gastritis with stomach ulcer, showing that it had been pushed deeper. This in turn pushes it to a deeper level and hypertension develops. Suppression of this condition brought on the depression, which was controlled with drugs triggering the menias. This is the hypothesis of, we have of how her current state of health has arrived after 40 years. So we have to try to unravel all this. So I'll show you. My initial repertorization. I think most of you will from, from those notes will understand it was pretty clear case. Fear of thunderstorms, very sympathetic, vertigo with vomiting. Um, the rhinitis, stomach ulcers, chocolate, cold water, and salt. I think not, not a difficult case to uh, understand. Um, surprising in some ways because she's in a lower group of health. Normally the, the remedies are not so clear. However, what this means is that she has a better possibility of recovery. Often in group three, it won't be clear at all, the remedy, and you have a much more difficult task. But this one, <clears throat> clear, which gives us a good starting point. It's always important in a chronic case to have a good starting point so that then the road becomes clear where we go from one place to another. Often I liken treating chronic cases as being lost in the woods. and. Uh, you're looking around and all you see is trees, trees everywhere. And there are, there are various paths through the woods. You don't know where they're going and you go down one dead end and you're trying to find your way onto the main path out of the woods. And at some point, often in a chronic case, you'll get onto that path with the correct prescription and then you have to follow the next prescriptions until they're out of the, out of the woods, as we say. So here we have a clear, clear remedy. I'm sure you all guessed phosphorus. Here we can see phosphorus has nine out of the 10 symptoms, almost an exact fit of remedy. The only symptom it doesn't have is the actually the many symptom. And here we have, I showed before, metadata. This is some nice mm -hmm. information in Compass that helps to differentiate remedies when you get this metadata symbol. So here you see we've got quite a few remedies coming up. And it's saying here, comparing lacaninum and phosphorus because of the salt. But lacaninum, as we know, likes hot pepper and phosphorus doesn't. And we have other information comparing argentum nitricum, which has come up here with phosphorus. Calcarea and phosphorus because they share many fears. Phosphorus has a greater desire 
cold water and less perspiration than calcarium. Nitrofuric acid and so on. Of course, to come, we see because of the sympathy, Horsticum always comes up close behind phosphorus. So in this case, first prescription was phosphorus 200C, single dose. <clears throat> Follow-up was one month later. And there'd been a big aggravation of the nose symptoms. Crusts forming in the nose, blocked nose, profuse, also profuse coryza running out, dark and yellow mucus. For one week, there was a big flare up of the nose with mucus pouring out of the nose, dark and yellow. For one week, as predicted for this level. Also, toothache and the headaches, which had previously gone, having given up the milk, headaches returned. So this suggests they're not really solved. Then an improvement in the symptoms steadily, 50 to 60% better. Headaches subsided, no vertigo attacks and gastritis better. This is after one month, a good one week aggravation and then improvement 50 to 60%. This perfect reaction, clear remedy, aggravation, amelioration. So our assessment here, <clears throat> prescription was correct, leading to an immediate aggravation lasting one week, gradual improvement, 60% better in a month. This confirms remedy given and level seven as aggravation is strong and can last up to a week. However, in order to be sure of a curative outcome, we need to see a return of, uh, of an acute situation with high fever. And this is really the only proof that they've changed level of health and returned back to where they were. Uh, it's not, not just enough for them to say, I feel better. We need to see a high fever come to be sure that they return to a uh, previous level of health. So with this prescription, of course, I said, wait, to see if things would continue by themselves to improve. Follow up to after another month, symptoms are the same but she reported two new symptoms have become apparent and constant. Head pain centered in the inner corner of the right eye socket and hot flushes are worse with burning red hot cheeks and right shoulder pain. So, Second analysis, here we've got the new symptoms added, red cheeks, burning face, hot flushes, right shoulder pain. Here we see still phosphorus, but we hear the new symptoms are all covered by sanguinaria canadensis. A remedy very useful in many migraine type conditions with vomiting, nausea and vomiting, which ameliorates, and periarthritis, particularly of the right shoulder. So, At this point, I decided to give Sanguinaria 200C one dose. Follow up, 
three, two weeks later, aggravation of the headache. Uh, aggravation of headache, then the right eye orbit pain went, hot flushes diminished, shoulder better. Uh, as developed hot feet at night, uncovering them. This is a sanguinary proving symptom. No symptoms the same. Headache in the morning on waking. So then I decided to wait. Two weeks later, no symptoms are the same. No further improvement and slight relapse. Not as good before as before. <clears throat> Desire for cold drinks and salt, very strong still. So here we see a phenomena where uh, an intercurrent remedies come in, new symptoms, the remedies taken these away. However, the underlying problems remains the same. Um, these may have been related to the menopause. So, transition three. Back to the main repertorization, the same things brings us back to phosphorus. has all the symptoms, main symptoms now. So prescription phosphorus 200 again repeated the dose single dose two weeks later, no effect. So what to do then? Obviously we increase the potency one M single dose two weeks later, no effect, the same. So here we have a phenomenon described by Hahnemann where the indicated remedy works well and then stops working. Different potencies make no difference. This is where uh, we think about a miasmatic influence is relevant and a nosode can be considered. Here, the obvious one is the tubercular miasm as phosphorus is so well indicated and there's a history of otitis and adenoid inflammation, also fevers with nosebleeds, and the affected area is the upper respiratory tract. So the question was here, was there any tuberculosis in the family? So on further questioning as to the origin of this chronic problem that started at 22, in relation to, to tuberculosis, after some days, she remembered that at 22 years old, remember this is when the whole problem started, she was in a shared apartment. She was a nurse and she had flatmates sharing the apartment and one of them was diagnosed with TB. And so she'd had a BCG, a TB vaccine, the whole everyone in the apartment were vaccinated against TB as she was exposed. And the symptoms started after this vaccine and she had never remembered this, why this had all started off at 22. And here we have the connection. Um, so at that point, We can put in a symptom here, it says personal history, tuberculosis, as if with the vaccine it's the same idea. And, um, let's see tuberculin, it hasn't come up of course because we haven't put any, she doesn't actually have any other tubercular symptoms, tuberculinum symptoms. So here we're using
they were using tuberculin and purely uh, as a nosode um, because of this history that she'd had with the BCG vaccine. So she got tuberculin and bovine 200C single dose. Also, there's a possibility, some of you may ask this question, why didn't you give BCG as a remedy? This is also a valid possibility and something I've done before when it's specifically you can um, link something to a specific vaccine. Uh, and sometimes this will open up the case. Here, I used the actual TB remedy rather than the BCG remedy. So follow up four, within two weeks, after one week of feeling very tired, she developed a flu-like acute, a bad headache and a high temperature of 39 degrees. All my symptoms have been worse, she said. This lasted for seven days. So one week aggravation again. In the last week, all symptoms much improved. Nose, headaches, flushes, vertigo, indigestion, all much better. Desire for cold drinks still. Had one nosebleed, which is an old symptom, an earache, old symptom. And since then, she'd been very well and fully recovered. Free of her symptoms for the first time in 30 years. I then had contact with her five years later and she was still doing very well. So here the assessment is that she finally produced her first high fever in 40 years, raised her level of health back to group one. Aggravation was one week duration again. Some old symptoms returned briefly, confirming the curative action of the remedy. And instead, the blood pressure had stabilized. Advice was given on diet and exercise, and the atenolol was removed. So, this is a phenomenon that uh, we see sometimes when. You get stuck in a case. Uh, Hahnemann described it very well, where we can we can get um, the indicated remedy stops working, or it doesn't work very well, or there's less action of it, and we go higher potencies, and then uh, we look for something that may be intercurrent remedy that may open the case up again, uh, and in this case. She hadn't remembered this BCG TB vaccine, which had kicked off all these problems. Uh, and it's not until she had this tuberculinum that she was able to recover, despite good prescriptions. The, the remedy, if you like, gets stuck. There's a barrier. Not until you give this nosode, she opens up that barrier and then everything starts to improve. Sometimes you need to go back to the phosphorus. For instance, in a case like this, you may need after some time to give phosphorus again, and then it starts to work better and better. Uh, luckily in this case, the tuberculinum cleared everything. Um, okay. Mm. So here we can see from this point in Encompass, you can do many things, which is to, here you have the remedies, open this rubric, you say, I want to have a look at tuberculinum, you click on it, it brings up tuberculinum materia medica. And here we get a nice picture from uh, George Fatulka's notes. These are unique to Compass. And, um, <clears throat> 
here we see often that, that we can give tuberculin if there's been a family history of TB, which can also act as a block. In her case, it was an acquired TB, if you like, through the vaccine. And despite not having any of the uh, typical tuberculin symptoms, no grinding teeth, no night sweats, no allergies, um, tuberculin worked purely on a miasmatic basis. And here we have Burraka. Here you see, this is interesting, he says here, well-selected remedies fail to improve. Certainly in this case, the phosphorus got to a point where it wouldn't improve any further. We have Clark Kent. And also an acute material medic, which is very useful, looking at acute applications of remedies. We have remedy relations. See phosphorus complementary. Phosphorus and tuberculinum we know are complementary. Okay. So, I think um, that's the case really. And um, we could have some more time for questions, I think this time. Uh, we've got quite a lot of questions in the chat. Maybe, Elena, if you could ask, look at some of the questions and uh, we can go through them. Elena, you are muted. Thank you, Andrea. <laughs> I'm just saying, Andrew, that um, everybody is congratulating you on a fantastic case. It is indeed a very good case, an interesting case, as always. Um, and you've captured all of your attendees. Now, I'm going to start with a few questions for you. Just a minute, let me just check here, okay. Right, so uh, I'll start with the first question, which is Katrine <coughs> Medlet, and she asks if you could explain how you differentiate between a strong, true aggravation lasting for a week and an aggravation resulting from a close but not exact remedy. Um, <clears throat> a close but not exact remedy, yes. Uh, well, one of the things you'll not see with a close remedy is an amelioration after the aggravation. So you may, you may get one or two symptoms improve, but you won't have a generalized amelioration after the aggravation. So I guess that's the main difference. Uh, in terms of the aggravation, um, I think with a a close remedy, you're not going to get an aggravation of such severity, I think. You may get an aggravation of one or two symptoms. Okay. So now this is from Tamara Praloff, and she asks, what would be your second choice if phosphorus failed? If phosphorus failed. I mean, phosphorus uh, originally as the remedy. Um, yeah. I don't. I, I can't really answer that because it, it was very clearly the remedy and it and it worked. So I, I didn't have a second choice. Okay. So Catherine Medlet asks again and says, "What happened to her personal energy during that week of aggravation? 
with the first phosphorus? Did she feel better or worse within herself? Yes, I, certainly in the aggravation, she felt terrible. And then the amelioration, she felt much better. So yes, great improvement. You can imagine after 40 years, 60% improvement. Uh, she started to feel more energy, more generally better in herself. And um, yeah, because there's been a lot of suppression, you see. All her conditions have been suppressed for many years. So the energy is all very low. She could only really uh, manage to look after her parents. And I, I remember actually when I met her five years later, she the parents had died, uh, obviously. and. Um, she was uh, doing very well, and I, I believe she was about to get married. She had found a relationship, and everything was starting to uh, happen in her life. You know. Okay, so um, now um, again, Tamara Pravo, she asks, "Do you give a placebo when you wait it after the sangria uh, after a sanguinaria?" Um, do I give a placebo? Uh, no, I just wait to see the responses. And actually, after the sanguine area, uh, there was no further improvement in the underlying chronic states. So then that was when it was time to prescribe again. Okay, so Georgiana asks Does this mean that sanguinaria was just similar and provoked a full relapse? Um, no, didn't provoke a full relapse, but um, I think it dealt with certain symptoms related to the menopause. I think it was a, it didn't really, it was a, was a particular, um, how can I say, level that she needed something to deal with those new symptoms that came up. Because you can wait in those instances, instance, see if the symptoms will disappear. Um, but as they stayed, then you needed this small remedy to deal with them. But the underlying state had already started to uh, relapse slightly. So um, it was like a layer, like a layer that needed treatment because of the new symptoms. Okay, so. Um... Uh, Mr. Manfred Bright asks, says uh, rather, it's a very good case to show, a very nice effect of vaccination dumping a level one patient to group three for years, and the defense mechanism is not able to recover. Great case, thank you for sharing. So this is just his comment, and I'm, I know you know him, so I'm, thank you, you know, I'm just. So uh, <clears throat> Ajay Beniwal, asks, was the sanguinaria the correct remedy? Yes. Yes, for that layer, it was correct. It took away the new symptoms, but not relating to the chronic state. It was like an acute state, I believe, to do with the hormones. Okay. Uh, Pam Muller asks, I'm interested to know why you didn't choose to give the BCG vaccine in yeah. potency since it was after a vaccination. Yeah, I mentioned that in the case, if you remember. I yeah, predict, I do, but... I predicted somebody would ask that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you'd be quite justified to use that as well. Uh, of course, I can't say what would have happened, but you could use BCG. It is, the, it is made from the TB. Uh, I just chose to use tuberculinum. I think probably mm -hmm. the response would have been similar. Okay, so um, what Lavinia, I, what I say, sorry. You know, what I would say at this point is there is this fashion in homeopathy for giving all these um, vaccines initially in a case. Uh, I, be, I believe this is wrong. Um, I think it's justified to give vaccines in potency if you can directly link the case to a vaccine, then I think this can be justified. If your remedies that you're using are not working anymore, then this is a good choice. But to give them 
to start off with. I don't believe that's correct homeopathy. Yeah, okay. So uh, Lavinia asks, Lavinia Chihaya asks, says that in Romania, every child receives a TB vaccine in multiple doses during the life, especially in the first year of life. Does this mean that everybody in my country should get tuberculinum sometime during their homeopathic treatment? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, it may be that many of those people will need VCG or tuberculinum as their remedy, yes, in their case. If they get stuck in the case, it's quite likely with that kind of multiple vaccination. The TB vaccine has a big effect on the organism. So it's, it's quite possible that quite a few of them will need it. Sometimes you can solve a case just with using normal remedies. You know, what we would call tubercular remedies, for instance, like phosphorus could solve the whole case. But, but many times, you yes, you will need tuberculinum for sure. Okay, and uh, now um, Sifesil Tombella asks, why didn't you ask about a family history at first? Is it possible to firstly use a miasm in order to choose a remedy than using the existing symptoms? Well, the thing is, this wasn't a family history. There was no family history. This was her history of TB vaccine. Uh, and she didn't remember all this in the beginning. It was only after I asked her directly about TB that it triggered her memory about the apartment and the, the flatmates. So you could, of course, ask family history, but in her case, you wouldn't have found anything. So what? how, how to use a, a nosoid in that case? We wouldn't have the indication. And, um, and also the phosphorus was uh, very well indicated. Okay, so we have, um, okay, Anna Catona asked the same thing, how you found the idea of tuberculinum. You explained that, so I'll go further. Rani Mann says the following. Usually the patients present with a lot of SXS, which seem to be equally important, how do you limit your analysis to just a few, in your case, 10 and less? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, it's a question of experience, I suppose, but um, it's really not a good idea to load up your repertorization with too many symptoms. The more symptoms you use, the more confusing it may be. Um, so you want to be using fewer symptoms, but distinct, clear, definite symptoms, ones that are definitely there rather than maybe there or some kind of conjecture of yours. So factual actual symptoms. Um, and I would say it's good to limit it to 10 symptoms, if possible, you get clearer results. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, again, Katrine Medlet, she asks, if in your experience, does the aggravation tend to be worse in cases where the symptoms have been suppressed allopathically? than when the person is not taking medication? Yes, that's a good case. Uh, good question. Um, yes, I think, I think so. I think the more suppression is, the more likelihood the aggravation will be stronger. Yes, I would say that's correct. Okay, so now Marlene, she asks, if a person develops multiple sensitivities, especially to certain foods, after hepatitis AB vaccine, and does not present a clear remedy picture, would you recommend giving the hepatitis A, B vaccine remedy to open up the case? Yes. Okay. Yes, if, it's, if there's really no clear picture being given, then you have to do something like that. Uh, and if it's definitely after the vaccine, then there's no, no question that, that that may start the case off. Yeah. 
for sure. Okay. And now Georgiana asks, after the first prescription of phosphorus, you waited for four weeks. Why did you only wait two weeks for the second and the third ones? Um, because I would expect to see after the initial uh, doses, um, I would expect to see uh, in further improvements within two weeks rather than four. So I felt two weeks was enough to, if she'd said, oh, there's another 10% improvement, I would have waited, but there was no change. You would expect to see some change in two weeks with the second and third doses. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Now, Anne asks the following, what level of health is a patient on if they develop a fever one month after the, the first homeopathic medicine, previous fever was two years ago and none for a few years before that. One month, yes. I mean, generally if the, the aggravation, the longer, uh, hang on, is this? Okay, they're developing a fever, not an aggravation. So they're developing an acute one month after the medicine. So that suggests a lower level of health. The longer it takes for the acute to appear, the lower the level of health. So one month's going to be lower. Normally in higher levels, you expect to see the, the, um, the acute to come. Well, it depends. <clears throat> Obviously, in the in the very upper levels, you want to see less acutes. But uh, when you're talking about group three with no fever for years after one month, that's a, probably a lower level of health, I'd say. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Now, Isabella Gobantis asks: Do you think one doses of tuberculimum two hundred C is enough? Yes, sure, one dose is enough. Single dose, as Hardeman taught us. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, why, why give more? And the reaction was perfect. Okay, very good. Now there's one last question, which is from Ashley Ross. And he asks, and he says the following. Dr. Marjorie Blackie in How Not to Do It says to not prescribe a new remedy until you see the whites of its eyes. Is it possible that the sanguinaria was a partial and was not really necessary? Are the new sanguinaria symptoms completely out of the realm of phosphorus, especially since phosphorus had provoked such a clear initial curative response? A good question, Ashley. That's um, that's true. Um, I did struggle with it a bit, but she was really suffering with these flushes and the right shoulder pain, um, and this this terrible pain in the right socket of the eye. So, for me, those symptoms weren't phosphorus symptoms at all. We didn't see it in the repertorization. Um, so. I would say that it was correct. It was just a layer. I believe it was to do with the menopause. So partial, I don't think partial, I wasn't really treating the underlying condition with this. It was a layer uh, and it worked well. It took away those symptoms and then we needed to continue with the case. So I would say it was a correct pres prescription. Thank you, Andrew. Now there's this, this um, I don't know who this participant is, the, he doesn't have a name, but he asked earlier on, but it seems he missed your answer. And he's asking again, he says he's sorry, he probably missed your answer. Why did you not repertorize her headache symptoms? Um, in the, do they mean in the beginning or when the, when the headache symptoms came back? When the headache, I presume from what I understand, when the headache uh, symptoms came back. In the follow-up, um, well, I don't, I don't tend to go too much into the details. Rather, I look at the the general, general physicals and generals. Um, 
so for me uh, I wouldn't have gone into trying to treat the headache really it, for me it was very interesting that the, the headache came back after the phosphorus whereas the, the headaches had gone once she'd given up dairy now the question is why did the headaches come back and in my opinion they they weren't really cured but they were just palliated because um, we know that in the tuberculum miasm there's there's a great intolerance of dairy and milk so we know with tuberculinum for instance they can love milk and dairy but they're very intolerant to it so i believe she had some kind of intolerance and then once she gave up the, the milk the headaches disappeared but they weren't cured and they came back with the phosphorus and then um off this sanguinaria pain was different to the other headaches but the headaches then cleared up after the tuberculinum so um there was no need to specifically repertorize the headache symptoms thank you andrew now basically all the rest are just comments on what a great case this was again Everybody is very enthusiastic about it. Thank you so much, Andrew. Always your cases are very, very good and very interesting and original. Um, it was an excellent case. So I will pass the floor to Dr. Gary Smith so he can do the closing. If you have nothing else to add. No. And, uh, okay, perfect. So Dr. Smith, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Eilina, and uh, and thank you, Andrew. That was a really excellent case, tremendous case. And there's lots more comments appearing in the chat box to that effect. Really excellent to see that degree of comorbidity and, 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 and multiple pathology and to be symptom-free after 30 years is tremendous, actually. So a uh, good reminder of what what homeopathy can do i think i say this all the time but um please get that published get that case published somewhere if you haven't already that's a really great case to get published if the patient is agreeable anyhow thank you very much andrew very enjoyable so thank you everyone for for coming today uh, a couple of closing comments from me um thank you to patilka's compass please contact eilina if you're interested, if you if you don't use Vitilka's Compass in your practice and you're interested in knowing more and, and considering using it, then please make contact with Eilina uh, on their web. Uh, the, her email address is on the screen and you can have a free trial period and uh, a 20% discount. And if you're a member of the Faculty of Homeopathy and you don't use Vitilka's Compass, you can get a 25% discount. So it's well worth contacting Eilina if you're interested in that next slide please andreas um and yes if you're not a member of the faculty of homeopathy you're you're more than welcome to join the the the, the faculty is headquartered in the uk but we're an international organization and i think at the last count we had members in 32 different countries around the world so um if you're not a member and you'd like to be please reach out and drop us a line info at facultyofhomeopathy.org or you can visit our website and if you do that you can get all sorts of membership benefits including access to the, uh, the homeopathy journal the only medline listed journal in the world that's dedicated purely to homeopathy and um, lots of other benefits as well including webinars like these uh, and other webinars at, at free or low cost um and various other membership benefits as well so please do contact us um a date for your diary please mark in your diary uh, the next installment in this series um i was right last slide uh, previous slide sorry andreas yeah the last um the next installment in this series is sunday the 10th of september so please save that date for uh, uh part 11 of this uh, of this series where andrew will be back again and uh, hopefully we'll all be back again to to have another great case so sunday the the 10th of, of september and final slide um please thank you yeah before then i wanted to to give you uh, notice of this very exciting very special event 
that's happening before then on uh, Saturday, the 29th of July, just under five weeks away. Um, Professor George Vitulgus will be joining us live from Alonisos. And Professor Vitulgus, as you might know, was recently awarded a, an honorary fellowship of the Faculty of Homeopathy. And he has never in the past delivered a uh, a webinar or, or, or an educational uh, event like this for the Faculty of Homeopathy. So this is the first ever. And we're really honored and delighted that he will be live on Saturday, the 29th of July. His subject is going to be fantastic. You can come and hear from the, the, the Grand Master himself um, about levels of health uh, in relation to chronic diseases and reactions uh, after the first prescription. And uh, that will be a very special event on Saturday, the 29th of July. Uh, you can register on our website. We hope to be able to, to send out the uh, an email uh, about the event to everyone. Um, it's at 4 p.m. UK time. Uh, so you can go onto the Eventbrite page and you can see your local time, but that will obviously be about half past eight uh, in India, uh, a bit before that in, in Eastern Europe and, and early in the morning in the US. Uh, so we've deliberately uh, placed it at that time so that uh, as many people as possible can attend. And I'll be, uh, God willing, will be opening and facilitating that event as well. And it would be great to see you all at that. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll thank again, Andrew, for a great case. Thank you, Alina, uh, and all the team at Vitilicus Campus. And most importantly, thank you to all of you for, for coming uh, today. And we hope to see you soon at the next installment. So thank you very much. Bye-bye.